Church, thanks so much for coming out to join with us. We serve the only God who broke the power of sin, death, and hell. And no one else has done that for us. He paid the price for our sins, amen? We're going to worship Him tonight. See, in the marvelous light, I'm running out of darkness and shame. He's the truth, the way, and the life. Sing it with us. Into marvelous light, I'm running. Out of darkness, out of shame. Through the cross, you are the truth. You are the life. You are the way. Oh, Christ, the solid rock I stand All 
you say you rose from death to victory. Oh, you rose from death to victory. You reign in life, oh majesty. Your name be high and lifted up for oh, Jesus. Jesus alive in us, oh Jesus. Jesus alive in us. If you're so glad that Jesus is alive in you tonight, say amen. Thank you so much for worshiping with us. Gilead, you may be seated. Thanks, Craig. Jesus alive in us. What a thought, huh? Jesus living inside of us. Great song. Great song. Thank you, praise team and band for singing and uh, leading us in worship. We're going to um, hop into the message tonight. If you would, let's turn to the passage we've been studying. By the way, how's everyone doing tonight? Thank you for braving the weather and coming out. It's uh, wonderful to have each of you. We're going to open to 1 Timothy chapter 6. This is the main passage we've been studying and living generously. And how many of you, how many of you have, have had opportunities where God has actually shown you ways to be more generous, just in everyday practical ways? You're, you're thinking about it, God's showing you. Wonderful, wonderful. Three people, absolutely awesome. Fantastic. It's really impacting us. All right, great to see that. I know more of you, you're just a little sheepish. Okay, so 1 Timothy chapter 6, let's go to the Lord in prayer, and we'll ask Him to bless tonight. Father, we thank you so much for what we're about to look at. We thank you so much for your word. And God, how it just clears the fog from our lives. And Lord, you know how uh, our minds tend to wander into um, untruths. And Lord, uh, your word just, just makes it so clear. And so God, we, we worship you for your desire to reveal what, what truth is. And Lord, that uh, we have reality uh, given to us through um, the scriptures. And so Father, I just ask that you be with me tonight. You give me the words to say that they would not just be thoughts that um, come from a human mind, Lord, that they would be insights that are from your Holy Spirit, and Lord, that you would be with every single soul in here, God, that our capacity to know you more would be increased, and that our desire for you, our passion for you, uh, that you would grow that as well. We ask this all in your precious Son's name, Jesus. Amen. Amen. We have a uh, common phrase that's used nowadays. Uh, with young children. I've, I've, I've actually had it happen to me once. I was standing around some new folks from, from the school that my kids go to uh, here at Baptist Park, and the young child did not know who I was, even though I was interacting with his mother, talking about you know, random things, because both my daughter and this child are in the same class. He looked up at me, pointed at me, said, stranger danger, stranger danger. And after I got done slapping him because he's being disrespectful, I realigned his is thinking, but he was alerting the fact that I don't know this person. So there's a common, common phrase that's used now that says "stranger danger." It's a tactic that we teach our kids that hey, if you don't know somebody, be careful. We're not going to actually talk about that meaning tonight, but that's where the idea of the message came from because we are going to talk about strangers. We're going to talk about um, biblical strangers, and we're going to talk about actually the reality that each one of us um, has an identity in this element where each of us are strangers. And um, so part of living generously is figuring out how to juggle this life that we have now today um, with our sin and our condition that we deal with, um, uh, with the reality of what God wants for our life and then the life to come. How do, how do we just make that all work? And so our, our intro tonight is um, our perspective on the present life should be influenced most by the life to come. Um, the way we should interpret and filter reality today, if you're trying to fi follow the way Scripture tells us to live, is actually not influenced by what my boss tells me today necessarily or what my, um, what's going on just in my marriage or just in my external circumstances. And if you're anything like me, your natural inclination is to, is to be affected. Your whole day is affected by what? Your external circumstances that you can see and touch and experience. And the Bible actually says that that's not the way God wants us to look at life. It actually says that he wants us to be so filled with what is coming. Okay, did you see that bug that just flew by? You didn't see it? Okay, totally distracted my thought. That was a total rabbit trail, but a bug just flew by. That was really weird. Okay, anyway, back to this. So our perspective in this life should not be distracted 
by little things that come into our path, like that little fly. Um, but we should have a mindset for what's coming, that there's this life that's coming, and it should not just be this hoity-toity, high and lofty thinking, that it should actually become practical and a reality in the day-to-day -day life. So when I'm having conflicts at home or when I'm dealing with things um, uh, at work or when I'm going through every moment, God wants me to be aware of what's to come. And so um, we're going to talk about that tonight in 1 Timothy chapter 6. This is the main passage we've been talking about, verses 17 through 19. Verse starts in 17. Instruct those who are rich in the, say these two words please, in the present age, not to be arrogant or to set their hope, like what you're, what you're putting your confidence in, on the uncertainty of wealth, but on God, who richly provides us with all things to enjoy, and instruct them to do what is good, to be rich in good works, to be generous, willing to share, storing up for themselves a good reserve for the, and then let's say this phrase together, ready? Age to come, so that they may take hold of life that is real. Take hold of life that is real. So Paul is writing to young Timothy, a pastor, and he's saying, listen, here's what I want you to teach the people with means in your church, that they can't put their confidence in their status here on this earth. And so he says, what I want you to do is actually pull away from what you think you are in this life and focus more on what? The life to come. That's what Paul's saying here. So don't let your money or let your talent or let your ability or your um, uh, you know, great skills at work be what you're putting your confidence in. You could go on through the list. Let it rely solely on your relationship with God. That's where your confidence should come from. And then when you do that, this life starts to take on a totally different meaning and purpose. Like everything changes. And nothing externally might change, but your mindset goes through a radical transformation where God wants you to see everything differently through a filter of his Holy Spirit. And so he says, let this life, this present age, be affected, totally transformed by the age to come. And so here's the first clue we're going to talk about with being strangers. The first point I, I wanted to point our attention to is aliens among us. Aliens among us. What does that mean? First Peter is going to de describe uh, the church. And this is the first verse of his book, 1 Peter, chapter 1, verse 1, and look how he addresses this church scattered throughout Turkey. He says, Peter, an apostle of Jesus Christ, to those who reside as aliens, scattered throughout Pontus, Galatia, Cappadocia, Asia, Bithynia, who are chosen. In another passage in 1 Peter, he writes, Beloved, meaning the church, I urge you as aliens and strangers to abstain from fleshly lusts which wage war against the soul. Now that's just a little verse, but it is so full of truth. Let's dissect it just a little bit. First thing, he says, I'm, I'm really urging you to listen to what I'm about to tell you. So he's very, very interested in the church reading this, pa this part of his letter over and over, letting it sink in. He says, I urge you to do what? To remember your identity. What's your identity? You're an alien. You're a stranger. You're a stranger. And he says, abstain from fleshly lusts, which wage war against the soul. Now, some of you, if, if you've been a believer for any period of time, you're going to find out that as, as God awakens you to the truth in your life and, and you start to take some steps spiritually, maybe God's convicted you in a sin and you're saying to yourself, you know what? I'm ready to do, I'm ready to do business with God. I'm ready to deal with this thing that has hold of me. It's just got me. Um, right where it hurts and I can't break through, but I'm, I'm declaring war. I'm going to go and, and ask God for help. You can almost be certain that you're, you're going to wake up to a week that is going to be absolute hell on earth. <laughs> because until you and I wake up to the truth that we need saving, the enemy lets us do what? Be asleep. Most believers um, experience these seasons where they're just asleep. You're just kind of like existing you ever felt like that as a believer? You read your Bible, there's nothing there. You pray, there's just, it doesn't feel like it's going anywhere. It's just a dry season in your life. And as you start to take steps and saying, God, I, I need to break through. I need you to do a work in my heart. Boy, does the enemy ratchet up. And look what our flesh wants to do as well in that verse. It says, listen, this flesh that you have is waging war against your soul. 
What is the significance of that? The soul of our lives, the soul of an individual is where the Spirit of God indwells. And every day, little did we know that no matter what you did yesterday, your flesh wakes up with a desire and declares war against the throne of God in your heart and in mine every day. And if we're just living blindly and carelessly and just kind of going through the motions, guess what we're doing? We are undermining the soul where God has the capacity to change us. If we're not careful, if we're not cautious, we're yielding to the enemy and we don't even know it. And that's exactly how he likes it. See, it's sober Christians who are awake and alert that, that the enemy hates. And so he turns up the heat. But if you're not having any heat in your life, there might be a chance where the enemy's looking at you going, I don't even want to stir the pot because I got him right where I want him. And so Peter says, listen, I want to urge you to remember you're an alien. If you, if you feel like you're just fitting in here and everything's going okay, something might be off. He's reminding this church, these churches scattered throughout, to say, listen, I know you're going through difficult times, but that's okay. That's proof and validation that you're actually not fitting in, which is a good thing to do. It's a good thing to do. And so he's saying, listen, I want to urge you, be careful here. This is your identity. And so let's look at what Peter meant. Another way to say uh, aliens and strangers is, here's another word for it, exiles, temporary residents, refugees, meaning you're a refugee, you fled for refuge, you're a foreigner, the place you live isn't where you belong, you're a stranger, you're a pilgrim, you're a sojourner. Those are all terms that are saying the same thing. Basically what? Here it goes on. Alien actually means belonging to another. Isn't that great? If you're an alien that, that, that is in Jesus Christ, you belong to Jesus Christ. Amen. And so what it means is you've been branded, you've been sealed, you are given over in your identity to God, and your identity isn't wrapped up in this world anymore. It's actually caught up with Jesus Christ in heaven right now. You say, well, I don't feel like I'm in heaven. The Bible says when you placed your faith in Jesus, your identity was sealed with Christ in God in heaven. And now the throne of God is your home. Isn't that great? Now look what this word is. It's the opposite of idios. And idios means one's own, meaning you belong to yourself. There's a lot of idioses in the world, okay? I didn't say that word that you're thinking, all right? If you go home to your husband tonight and say, you're such an idios. You don't, don't use that as a ploy to get that word through. Idios means you belong to yourself. And you, you've encountered people like that. They, they have no clue that how they live is so grating and difficult and, and offensive and, and hurtful and painful. Why? Because they belong to themselves. There's no other authority in their life except for them. And so Peter says, listen, we're not idiosis. We don't belong to ourselves. All right? We belong to God. We, we belong to another. That's Jesus Christ. And you say, well, when did this happen? Because I don't remember waking up and, 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 you know, I don't have an alien inside my, you know, body trying to get out. I don't feel like an alien. And here's what the Bible says. This is the moment when we became aliens. Colossians 1.13 says, He has rescued us from the domain of darkness and transferred us into the kingdom of the Son He loves. Corinthians says, 2 Corinthians says, Therefore, this is my grandpa's favorite verse, If anyone is in Christ, he is a new creation. Old things have passed away, and look, new things have come. And one of that new things is, is an identity. Your identity, you went from being a citizen of this world before Christ and having your feet firmly planted in the way it thinks about life and yourself and your rights and, and your direction of your life and how you deserve this and you deserve that and I deserve. All of that was traded away because you became a citizen of God's kingdom. Jesus transferred us from the domain of darkness where everyone is an idios. They're their own. They belong to themselves. And God said, now you, Jack, and you, Gilead, you are mine. You belong to me. You are children. You are sons and daughters of the living God. Amen. That's what our identity is now. And sometimes, if you're like me, you don't wake up and go, that's not the first thought that hits your mind. You, you just... It's more comfortable to be this guy, the idios. Like, I belong to me, right? It's about me, right? And God says, no, no. You've been given over. You're a stranger. You belong to me now. And when we became believers in Christ, when you gave your life to Jesus, you gave away your former life, your former identity, and you said, I'm with you. 
I'm identifying with you. I belong to you. A new creation. The old things don't work anymore. They don't work anymore. Here's some forget-me-nots. These are just some bullet points I want us to remember about uh, this, this series on living uh, generously. Forget-me-nots. Let's go through this. Don't forget why we're generous. Because as Christians, we're going to constantly have to deal with this. Why be generous? When the world just passes us by and maybe doesn't even notice our generosity, why even try? How many of you thought like that? You know, why, why take it when the guy cuts me off in the road? Why can't I show him the one way to heaven sign as I, as I pass by in the other lane, right? Why, can't, why do I have to abstain? Why do I have to pull back on my impulses? Why do I have to be generous with other people? You ask yourself, why? And here's why. It tells us in Ephesians 2, 11 through 13, these are great verses. It says, don't forget that you Gentiles, who's Gentiles? You and me. We're outside of the Jewish nationality. Used to be outsiders. You were called uncircumcised heathens by the Jews who were proud of their circumcision. And even though it affected only their bodies and not their hearts, they were still proud of it. In those days, you were living apart from Christ. You were excluded, now here we go, ready, from citizenship among the people of Israel, and you did not know the covenant promises God had made to them. You were, you were so way on the other side of, of what God had for, for your life. This is where we came from. You lived in this world without God and without hope. Man, you remember that when you were an unbeliever? No hope. Like, what do you do with your sin? What do I do with this guilt? What do I do with this stuff inside that I can't deal with? Where's my hope at? Isn't the world starving for hope? There is like nothing hopeful. Watch the news. You're going to find hope on the news? It's depressing. And so we have all this swirling around us, and somehow, some way, God says, but I still want you to not be idiosis. I want you to belong to me. And he says, you were far from God without hope, but now, look at this church, but now you've been united with Christ Jesus. Once you were far away, from God, but now you've been brought near to him through the blood of Jesus Christ. Now those verses, you and I would stand, it would do us well to just memorize that and go through it every single day. Because if you're like me, you're going to wake up and you're going to get this chip on your shoulder. You're going to have this attitude where you're like not quite as tender and flexible as you really, you know, we ought to be towards the Spirit. And these verses remind us of what Jesus has done for us. We were on the outs and God brought us in. And to go over that in your mind every single day is something God constantly wants us to do. That's, that's what we, the Bible refers to as renewing your mind, right? How do you renew it? You go back to some of the fundamental truths. Man, look where my life would be without Christ. You ever thought about that? You ever have any peers of yours that, that haven't made the decision about God that you've made and you see where their life has ended? And we shouldn't stand in judgment of them. We should look at them and go, man, if it wasn't for God's grace, just as unmerited, undeserved favor in my life, I'd be there too. Every one of us has that testimony. And we need to bring that into our memory bank every day. Remind yourself, this is where I belong. I deserve judgment. I deserve God's punishment. But Jesus has graciously poured out love where God could have poured out wrath. And I got to go back there every single day and remind myself of that. I want to show you a, uh, a picture of what Paul is referencing here. It's uh, the court of Gentiles. And there's a, uh, I think we have it up there, a picture of a stone, and it has some text on it. And here's what the text says. This was uh, uh, right on the gate of uh, the temple where the Jews would go to worship. And so there was this big, big fence, like this big uh, gate or wall, and then you would go in, and there would be this outer court. And that court was for you and I. If we were God followers, is what they were called, they were the people who practiced Judaism, you, uh, you thought God was, was uh, someone to pursue, and you were looking at the Hebrew God and going, man, I believe in him. There were people who, uh, Jews were missionaries way before the Christians were, and so they were constantly witnessing to people, setting up synagogues, but there was a place for the Jews. There was a place for those uncircumcised heathen, you and I, and it was the outer court of Solomon's temple. And so you were, you were there, and then you would walk through this threshold that only Jews could get through. 
you and I wouldn't even be allowed to access it. And so they had this stone. When Herod rebuilt the temple, he put these stones out to, as a warning because he wanted people to take it very seriously. And here's what that stone says. No man of another nation, a Gentile, is to enter within the fence and enclosure around the temple, the inner court. And whoever is caught will have himself to blame that his death is ensured. So your death will immediately follow. It was a capital crime for you and I as Gentiles to walk into the inner court beyond the Gentile court. It was a capital crime worthy of death in the Jewish faith. You say, wow, Herod was a mean guy. That was actually God's plan. God wrote that law. And he said, listen, this is where the Gentiles can come, but this is where my chosen people are allowed to go. We were not belonging there. We belonged in the outer court. And sometimes when you're a believer, you get a little bit, you know, you get a little bit stagnant with that. You forget that. You start to think you, you're entitled to the Lord. You know, you start to develop an attitude like, like, you know, we don't even look at his words sometimes the way we should. You know, reading our Bible, man, if we got to get up a little bit earlier and read, oh, it's just so... If I got to pray and ask God for help and wait on him, man, I'm suffering like Paul suffered. I've, I've done a prayer request and I haven't heard from God and it's been like three hours, you know? And we'll just kind of get this attitude in our life and it's so self-focused and self-driven. And, and so I, I, I found this story that I think would, would kind of enlighten you on, on what I'm trying to um, go after here. And it's about this little boy named Leroy. And Leroy wanted a, a red bike. I want to read this story to you. Little Leroy, um, he came into the kitchen where his mom was making dinner. His birthday was coming up, and he thought this was a good time to tell his mother what he wanted. Mom, I, uh, I want a bike for my birthday. Little Leroy, however, was a bit of a troublemaker. He'd gotten into trouble at school and at home, and Leroy's mother asked him if he thought he deserved to get a bike for his birthday. Little Leroy, of course, thought he did. Leroy's mother, being a Christian woman, wanted Leroy to reflect on his behavior over the last year, so she said, go to your room and think about how you behaved. Then write a letter to God and tell him why you deserve a bike for your birthday. So little Leroy stomped up the steps, frustrated to his room, and sat down to write God a letter. Letter number one, Dear God, I've been a very good boy this year, and I'd like a bike for my birthday. I want a red one. Your friend, Leroy. Leroy knew it wasn't true. He had not been a very good boy this year, so he tore up the letter and started over. Letter number two, he says, Dear God, I've been an okay boy this year. I still would really like a bike for my birthday. Leroy. Leroy knew he couldn't send this letter to God either, so he wrote a third one. God, I, I know I haven't been a good boy this year. I'm very sorry. I will be a good boy if you just send me a bike for my birthday. All right, so he's having a little work from the Holy Spirit on his heart. Please, thank you, Leroy. Leroy knew even if it was true, this letter wasn't going to get him a bike. By now, Leroy was very upset. He went downstairs, told his mom that he wanted to go to church. Leroy's mother thought her plan had worked as Leroy looked very sad. Just be home in time for dinner, Leroy's mother told him. So Leroy walked down the street and actually went to the, to the uh, cathedral on the corner. Little Leroy went into the church and up to the altar. He looked around to see if anyone was there. And Leroy bent down and picked up a statue of the Virgin Mary. He slipped it under his shirt and ran out of the church, down the street, into the house, and up to his room and sat down. With a piece of paper and a pen, Leroy began to write his final letter to God. You ready? Letter number four. God, I've got your mama. If you want to see her again, send the bike. Signed, you know who. All right? And inside all of us, I got your mama. Inside all of us is that little Leroy who's like, God, we can make a deal, right? I got rights, right? It's kind of still about me, right? And God says, no, Jack, it's actually all about him. And boy, that just kind of doesn't come naturally to me. It kind of has to, I got to work through that every day. And so I go back to verses like Ephesians and I remind myself, God, you're worthy of that. I know there's no deals. I know I don't have any rights because of what you've done for me, I'm going to claim rights. I don't want rights. I don't want to start walking the path of what I deserve. How terrible would that be? So I said, I, I, you know, we were out. We were not a part of God's chosen people. And then Paul comes in and he says, but grace stepped in and it has made you children of God. 
There was nothing you could do, nothing you just. The real seeds of Abraham, he goes on to say, are children that are, that are Abraham's children of the promise, the belief that God was going to fix for them what they couldn't fix themselves. Those are Abraham's kids. That was the seed of faith. That's what makes us believers. That's what makes us Abraham's kids, that we put our faith in God the way Abraham did. The second don't forget is uh, who we're generous for. Or this reminds us who we're generous for. Psalm 31, 1 and 3 says, O Lord, this is uh, King David writing, I have come to you for protection, so don't let me be disgraced. Save me for, uh, for you do what is right. Now listen to what he says in verse 3. You are my rock and my fortress. For the honor of your name, lead me out of this danger. And when you start making strides in your relationship with the Lord, you know what starts to happen? As David's writing this passage, what he's saying here is, God, everybody knows that I have risked and leveraged everything on you. Everybody knew it. If you spent time with David for five minutes, you knew a couple things. He was a warrior, and he was passionately pursuing God with his life. He absolutely desired what God desired for his life. He put God's desires above his own. And so when you, t- you would have talked to him, you'd have seen a man consumed with God's desires. And so what he's saying here is, Lord, this is his prayer. I put everything on you and everybody knows it. And so if I fail here as king, if I don't, if I screw up as a king, God, it's not my reputation that I'm going to lose, but what are they going to think about you? What are they going to think about you? David is more concerned about God's reputation and how people would view him. Remember when Moses was leading the children out of the wilderness and, um, God gets really frustrated because they're down building the calf and the golden calf. And he says, Moses, you know what? I'm just going to wipe them all out. We'll start over, you and I. And what does Moses say? He says, God, listen, if you do that, you're going to validate all these false claims from, from the pagans that are saying you brought these people out here to die. Don't do that, please. For the, for the honor of your name, don't do that. You want to know when we'll start to really live generously? When we start to really be concerned about how I am revealing the name of God to other people in my life. If you and I start to think like that, like, how is my speech reflecting that? How is my, the way I talk to others, how is that coming across? As, is that honorable? And man, let me tell you, just this week, there, I have so violated that, that standard with my words how I've talked to people. I've not spoken with grace. I've spoken with the little Leroy inside, right? Give me, give me, give me, because I deserve it. That's wrong. God, God, didn't, God did way beyond that for me to speak like that to people. Amen. And so when I look at this, David says, listen, I'm concerned about you, Lord, so don't let me fail here, please. If you and I started to pray like that, God, listen, you know my frustration at work, and I don't want to ruin... My testimony, which is what you've done in my life, will you please help me? Give me wisdom for the sake of your honor, for the sake of your name. Wouldn't that be a great prayer? Start working that into your life. Lord, you know the enemy's out to destroy my family. It's out to destroy my marriage. It's out to ruin us and and, and totally decimate us spiritually. So God, please, for the sake of your honor, will you please breathe new life into my marriage? Breathe new life with my children. Breathe new life with my coworkers. Breathe new life in all these areas for the sake of your honor, Lord. You don't think God's going to hear that? God's going to go, wow, oh, that's a prayer. It's not just about me. It's about God Amen. and his reputation. And David prays that. Look at another verse in 1 Corinthians. This is Paul writing. For I am the least of the apostles. Paul's talking about how he's an apostle, and it's kind of a mystery to himself. And not fit to be called that because I'm, I, I persecuted the church of God. But by the grace of God, I am what I am. And his grace toward me, now look at what he says here, church. His grace toward me did not prove vain. Well, let's stop that. That word vain is ica. And it means without purpose, without just cause, without success. And some of us, we've seen so much grace poured out into our life. But sometimes there's just something missing. It's like it's in vain. Like God has done all this for us, but there's no impact. There's no 
I'm, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to overcome. I want to live in victory. And I think most of us, if you're a believer for any period of time, you have these seasons where you just kind of get comfortable with having a boot on your throat. And Paul says, God, please don't let your grace be in vain on me. Don't let it be without results, without success. Let it be real. Let it be true. Let me be victorious in my life so that I can bring you honor. Because what you've done, God, it's mind-blowing. I'm an apostle. This is what Paul's saying. I'm an apostle. I was persecuting the church, and I don't care what you did this week or what you've done in your past. None of you were hunting Christians this week, I don't think. Right? And this is that man. That man wrote over half the New Testament. He says, I, I can't believe it. God, you have, you have enabled me to let your grace not be done in vain. And it doesn't mean that his grace, like he's not going to heaven. It means it's got impact to his life. It affects him in everyday circumstances, practically. It means something. And what Jesus did on the cross should mean something in everything we do. Everything. It should have impact. Like, you know what? Our marriage can't be like this anymore because Jesus Christ has shown us grace and favor that we couldn't deserve. God, please don't let it be in vain. Man, we start praying like that. God, my heart, let it beat for you. Please, don't let it be in vain what you've done for me because after being a believer for some time, it just starts to become robotic. And Paul says, none of the status quo. God, please fill me with the awareness of your favor, undeserved. And most of us, we shy away from our weaknesses. If you're like me, you shy away from what you struggle with. You don't really bring it out into the light. And Paul says, are you kidding? I'm going to glory in that. Amen. I'm going to boast in that. You know why? Because it's absolutely proof that I didn't do anything to get here. God alone is the, is the, is the only source of my strength and victory in this life. Amen. And he totally takes away that insecurity and says, yeah, this is who... Can you believe it? I was hunting the church. And God made me an apostle. I saw Jesus with my own eyes. And his grace is not going to be in vain. I think that's a prayer we can pray every day. God, at work today, please, don't let your grace be in vain in my life. Make it have impact in, in who I am and what I'm doing. It says, uh, I also wrote down, don't forget where generosity is stored. 1 Corinthians 3, 11 through 12 says, for no one can lay any other foundation. This is Paul writing. And he's talking about the foundation of Jesus. Then what has been laid down, that foundation is Jesus Christ. And then he says, that's our foundation. This is the source of our salvation. This is where faith begins in the person of Jesus Christ. If anyone builds on that foundation with gold, silver, costly stones, wood, hay, or straw. And then he says, you can build on this foundation that you have. So as a believer in this life, remember we we're talking about this present age. He says, in this present age, you and I have the choice to either build on the foundation of Jesus with gold, silver, and precious stones, or with wood, hay, and stubble. And Paul says, listen, I don't want you showing up empty-handed and embarrassed. That day's coming. So what I want you to do is build very, very carefully in this present life because of the life to come. We're heaven-bound. We belong to another place. We're citizens of another place and location. Our faith is for a person, not a system. And here's the conclusion tonight. It says, our inspiration to be generous increases as we look forward to the coming generosity of God. I'm going to go back to Abraham in a minute, but here's what I want you to grasp. That when you're reading the scriptures and you're looking at the Bible and, and you're, you're you know, going through the daily reading and you're looking at some of these passages that talks about what's to come, those are really, really important. Those act as buoys in this life. You know, a buoy or, or a life vest, it, it keeps you afloat because the waves of life kind of come in. And if you're not careful, if you're not living intentionally, that stuff's just going to, it just drowns you out. I mean, it's just hard to keep up with all that in your own strength. And so God deposits these wonderful truths of future things to come. And he says, this is what's going to help you. And we actually have an example of this in the Bible. Back to Father Abraham, it says in Hebrews 11, 8 through 10, it says, by faith, Abraham, when he was called by God, obeyed and went out to a place he was going to receive as an inheritance. So Abraham is this guy from uh, the Chaldees, and then he gets called out, and he's, he's walking into this area, and this is the promised land. He travels miles and miles and miles to get to this area where God wants him to go. He went out not knowing even where he was going. 
And he says, by faith, he stayed. So the first thing is God called Abraham to a place he didn't know. He wasn't even sure if he was, you know, uh, where the place was going to be. He was like, God's going to show me what that place is like. He's going to take me there. By faith, he stayed as a foreigner in the land of promise. He, he built his roots there. He planted his life in there, living in tents with Isaac and Jacob. This is a great picture of when someone comes to Christ. You don't have to know the whole story. You don't have to figure out every last doctrinal detail before you can come to Christ. You know what gets you to Christ? I need you, Jesus. Amen. I need you. Will you please save me? That's it. Amen. And man, we get all like hot under the collar. But are they sincere? Does it really matter? Is it, you know, how's it going to all work? And, and, and Abraham didn't even know. I don't know where we're going. Come on, honey, we're going. You know, that doesn't sound like a great planner, right? In, in today's world, that guy would probably not be looked at as though he, he had all his marbles. And he says, I, I don't know, but I'm hearing a voice from God. He's telling me to go. Let's go. I'm going to trust him. And that's all you need to know. And that's great with God. God does not ask you to have the faith for five years from now. God is only asking you to have the faith for this moment. Amen. Have the faith for this moment. And you know, if you're like me, you wander into the future where your feet don't belong the feet of your mind cannot figure out what's going to, go, going to happen five years from now. So why spend your time thinking about it? Jesus says, there's enough worry for tomorrow. Focus on today. Just get through the day. And by faith, have faith in God for this moment. And he goes on and he says, he stayed as a foreigner. And then look at this. He says, uh, by faith he stayed and living in tents with Isaac and Jacob, co-heirs of the same promise. These are his boys and his grandson. They're co-heirs. They're the same ones that God chose for he was looking forward, and look at this, looking forward to the city that has foundations, whose architect and builder is God. So here's Abraham. He's been called out, but the land isn't his yet, technically. There's no deed to the property yet. David isn't around. Joshua isn't around. Moses isn't around. All that is still hanging in the balance. That's in the future. And what God says is, Abraham, wherever you walk, it's all yours. And so he has to believe him for it without getting the actual binding contract. He had to believe in faith what David was going to see in sight. David was going to set up his kingdom in Jerusalem. And he says, you know what sustained him? You know what got him through those moments where he was like, are you sure this is going to happen? And don't tell me Abraham didn't struggle with faith. How do you explain Hagar and Ishmael? Right? That was a little moment of, of oops, I forgot, to, I forgot to put my faith in God. Right? I forgot that it's not by sight, it's by faith. And so he says, I'm looking on, here's how he did it. I'm looking on to the city that is before me. I'm looking on to the city where God is the architect and builder of it. I'm not designing this plan. This is all God's plan to his credit, to his glory. So Abraham turned his attention more and more as he grew with God to what God wanted to, to have happen in his life. And this is not as hard a, of, of an image to think. When I um, first started dating Molly, um, I fell deeply in love with Molly, okay? I was just a, uh, just, I mean, a mushball in love kind of guy. And I actually uh, professed my love for her, and she decided to have me wait a few days just to make sure that, that it was legitimate. Okay, and so I, I love you, and it was silence on the other end. And, and you know what? It, it didn't make, make me love her any less. I was like, well, I'm not giving up. I already put it out there. I'm going to stay on the course, you know, and win this girl. And, and I just, I would think and dream, dream about how to win her heart. You would just, I'm sorry, guys, you remember those days? Remember? Yeah, remember you used to just sit and be like, what could I do to totally make her fall in love with me? You know, and your, your mind would just kind of get lost in it. So one day, um, I came up with this, this plan to uh, uh, just take her alone to a park, you know, and look at the stars and, and just kind of look up at the sky. And, and I was just falling deeply in love with her. And um, uh, all of a sudden, you know, some cops pulled up. And uh, they said, what are you guys doing here? And I said, oh, we're just hanging out. You know, I didn't have a great answer. Um, I'm 18, she's really beautiful, and I want to be around her. I don't know how to explain it, you know. And so he said, well, you need to leave, park's closed, and so um, you need to get out of here. And I would, I, I would spend so much time thinking about how I could win her heart. One time I, I um, you know, I, I took her out to the field house because I'm such a romantic. Our field house is a, if you ever need romantic ideas, just come see me for sure. 
And I had set up, this is when she was, you know, she was kind of like, I don't know, I don't know, I don't know if I should like the guy, he's kind of weird and all that kind of stuff. And so um, I was still trying to win her and I took her out to the field house and, um, you know, I think I was 17, 18 at the time and I had some, some slow music playing and I had some candles set up and I just, you know, we didn't, we weren't allowed to have prom at our school. So I don't think Mr. Cook, I think this is the first time I'm actually telling you, I used his facilities for my own personal prom, but um, <laughs> it worked really well. Thank you, Mr. Cook. Um, and so I, I spent some time just kind of dancing with her and, and I, do I know how to dance? Absolutely not. I have no idea what I'm doing, but I would be the fool for her. I just didn't care. I didn't care if people, you know, what people thought. I just, I would dream about it. I would write down these letters and this, and you know, this, and you know what happens when you get married sometimes? Life. And sometimes you just, you're just like ships passing, like, hey, yeah, I married you, right? Yeah, that's right. And your heart, it isn't that you don't love her or that you're not passionate about her. If anyone tried to steal her, you would fight for her, anything like that. But the heartbeat is, it changes. And, and, and some of that's maturing. You know, you can't live in that crazy state of being in love all the time. But there is a part of that, that where those fires need to be rekindled and stoked. And, and you have to work at that. And sometimes I think as believers... Isn't that what Jesus said in the book of Revelation? You've lost your first love. Where'd it go? Remember when you used to just daydream about me? Remember, church, when you would just think about how I saved you from your sin? Remember those simple days where it was just enough for you to know how much I cared for you? Remember that? I want that back. And you can hear Jesus' calling for us to just get back to the heart of it, to get to daydream a little bit again, to dream about how we can please Jesus' heart, not out of a sense of duty or obligation, but because of what Jesus has done for us, Amen. because of how he saved us. And if you and I aren't careful, we'll have all the right answers, we'll say all the right things, we'll come to all the church services, we'll do all the outward stuff, but there is nothing beating here anymore. Amen. It's just motions. And Abraham said, listen, it isn't about this life. I'm a stranger here. I'm not going to fit. I've already resolved it. I'm okay with it now. But I'm going to look forward to the day when I'm with Jesus. I mean, can you imagine the day where you and I are going to come to Jesus and there is going to be nothing between us anymore? I don't have to wake up tomorrow and ask for his grace to not be such an idiot today. That's going to be awesome. Amen. I'm going to be fully known, I'm going to be fully glorified. And everything in me is going to desire him. And you know what? Sometimes we just let a little bit too much of our, we let our minds stew a little bit too much on this world. And we need to step away at times and go, God, man, look what you're going to do. And like Abraham say, God, I'm pressing on to that. You know, Hagar and Ishmael, that little mishap, that could have haunted Abraham the rest of his life. He could have said, God, I'm too much of a screw up now. I want to be the father of faith. After I did that to my wife, to my legacy, God says, Abraham, I'm not done with you. Because what I'm doing in your life isn't dependent on you, Abraham. It's dependent on me. Did you know God made that promise with Abraham with himself, of his own authority? Jesus Christ is going to get us to heaven fully glorified, fully in love with God the Father. Amen. And you think, well, how's that going to happen? Because it's fully dependent on him. Amen. Aren't you glad for that? It's not dependent on your performance as a Christian. Not dependent on how much Bible you read, how much prayers you, you throw up to heaven. It's solely dependent on the work of Jesus Christ. And God said, it is finished. It's all done. It's perfect. And God loves it. Would you stand to your feet, please? We're going to bow our heads, close our eyes. I want to give you an opportunity. If you haven't today given your life to Jesus, if you haven't totally surrendered your life, if there is something that's holding you back, if God's tugging at your heart through his Holy Spirit and you've never taken that initial step of giving your life to Jesus Christ, I, I want to I pray for you and I want to ask, um, I want to lead you in a prayer and give you an opportunity to make that decision tonight. And this is all you have to say. Dear Jesus, I know I need you. I know that I'm a sinner. 
meaning I can't do it myself. I can't fix what's broken inside me. Will you do it for me, please? I call on you to save me and to cleanse me from all the things that I do wrong. Will you please do that in my life? Anybody who prayed that prayer with heads bowed, eyes closed, no one's looking around. If you prayed that prayer, would you slip your hand up, anybody? For those of you who have, yes, ma'am, I see your hand. For those of you who have been a believer, but there are obstructions to getting lost in your relationship with Jesus again. You're not able to look forward to the day when he is on his throne. Those, those thoughts just aren't in your heart. And you're consumed with the worries and the cares of this world. And tonight, you're ready to like start doing some digging and lay those things down. You're going to start putting your eyes not on the world around you, but on what Jesus Christ has already prepared for you and is he is just waiting with bated breath to share it with you. If you want to start doing that tonight and putting your eyes on heaven and getting your eyes off of this earth and all its worries and concerns, would you raise your hand, please? Hands all over. All of us are needing to do this. Jesus, let's pray this together with me, church. Jesus, we ask that you would please do a work in our heart. God, our lives, our cups are full of this world, full of worry, full of angst. What's going to happen? How's it all going to work out? And God, we're coming to you because you said you've taken care of it all. And Jesus, we want to put our confidence in you, our hope in you. Lord, I pray for every believer here tonight that you would please begin to do a work in them where their eyes would be transformed, their inner man and inner woman would be totally remade and reformed to realize that they're a stranger in this life, but that that's okay. They can put their confidence in you. We ask this in your precious son, Jesus, his name, amen. Church, we're going to close with a song. Would you please continue singing? Let's worship Jesus with this song, please. You rose, you rose from death to victory. You rose in life on majesty. Jesus, Jesus.